Hi, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. We're continuing along with the Milky Way for our final bit about the nature of the Milky Way itself. But we're going to start by looking first at the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the nearest bright, large galaxy to the Milky Way. And let's say we take an optical view, such as we see on the left of the entire Andromeda Galaxy, and focus instead just on the central regions, and we look in the X-ray area. So we use the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And if we zoom in, looking with a combined X-ray and optical view of the center, we, so we find that the blue glow, which is due to X-ray emission, has a series of very, very, very bright point-like sources, as well as a lot of diffuse emission coming from the center. So what exactly is this bright x-ray source at the center of Andromeda Galaxy? What is it? Well, we may very well ask the same thing. What's at the heart of the Milky Way? And this is a, there's a laser tracking, uh, an artificial star created by an observatory down at, uh, at the VLT by the European Southern Observatory. Interesting photos taken by people uh, with, under the deep night sky. And that laser is pointed at the sky to make an artificial star to use adaptive optics so you can actually look at the deepest, deepest, deepest center of the Milky Way. So adaptive optics is critical for doing that, and that's what we talked about in a much, much, much earlier episode, and that allows us to see, the, to, see to get a better view of something obscured by clouds. All right, so remember that dust is blocking completely our optical view of the center of the Milky Way. So we have to use infrared or radio observations or X-ray observations in order to see what's happening down in the center of the Milky Way. Because we can see the center of, of, the, of the Andromeda galaxy because it's open and facing to us. It's just millions of light years away, so that doesn't count. We want to see what's in our backyard. Well, if we combine a series of observatory images of a large area of the sky using NASA's great observatories, specifically the Spitzer Infrared T Telescope, the Hubble in the near infrared, meaning just a little bit longer than the red, about 10,000 angstroms or so, and the Chandra X-ray Observatory, we combine these together and we see an incredibly turbulent area in the downtown central area of the Milky Way itself. There's lots of shredded gas and huge star formation and x-ray emission and dust and gas all careening about. So it's a turbulent, violent downtown area. But let's see what we can determine what the heck is actually going on there. If we look specifically in x-rays by the Chandra X-ray Observatory and do uh, look at the inner 400 by 900 light years, we see there's a huge number of x-ray point sources and these are likely neutron stars and black holes, but there's also dead center some very, very diffuse, large, bright x-ray sources, especially one the most intense is actually towards the center. And that's really what we're going to be looking for. We can actually then also look at the same rough size scale, but tilted at an angle in 90 centimeter, almost meter long wavelengths in radio emission. And we also see extraordinarily bright things happening. We also see uh, circular spherical features as well. Those are, radio, those are radio lobes due to expanding gases from supernovae. We also see kind of snake-like structures that are very similar to prominences around the sun, except they extend many, 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 many light years. Now, if we then zoom in even more with higher resolution using the Chandra X-ray Observatory, the inner 100 by 100 light years, we see diffuse X-ray emission, but it gets brighter and brighter towards the center. There's even more point sources from neutron stars and black holes that are towards the center. But it's, again, that incredibly hot diffuse gas that is millions of Kelvin that somehow is being heated to extraordinary temperatures close to the center of the Milky Way. And this shows it again that, that where Sagittarius A star is actually the center where this bright radio emission is coming from that we saw in the other image. So this X-ray emission is, is in diffuse cloud forms as well as lots of lots of uh, point-like sources. And those cloudy forms are, are superheated gas that's been heated to millions of degrees and is emitting X-rays. 
and the inner region has a lot of uh, very interesting bits. There are non-thermal filaments and radio arcs, and the radio image shows that there's an enormous magnetic field that's causing uh, electrons to, and protons to spiral at very high speed, nearly the speed of light, throughout the entire, throughout the entire, throughout through these magnetic fields causing these filamentary structures. There's also supernova remnants labeled S and R, uh, and those supernova remnants are the result of an, of an exploded star. But there seems to be a, a large number of them, so for some bizarre reason there's lots of supernovae happening in there, and the dimensional scale is about a thousand light years across that, across that dashed line from upper left to lower right. In any event, we have uh, we can zoom in in radio views. We can take the VLA image. We can zoom in further and look at closer and closer and closer. And as we zoom in to these closer and closer images, we see finer and finer details of radio disruption. Uh, but each of these is a different wavelength. That's the real trick. Is we don't actually have we don't we can't do this with the same wavelength because you get different resolutions at different wavelengths. So we have to actually change our wavelength of observation in order to zoom in closer and closer, with the last one being the shortest wavelength is infrared. So this is another, uh, this is another radio image, uh, also VLA, that demonstrates that there's enormous radio arcs, which are the magnetic field of that region accelerating material uh, and having synchrotron emission, meaning that, that brightness that looks like an arc is a result of electrons spiraling at nearly the speed of light in a very strong magnetic field, and as they do so, they emit radio light. And there it is again, another radio arc image, just to show you that, and it looks very interesting. It has a wispy sort of structure as the magnetic field spans hundreds of light years out from the center. But we have that bright source that's deep in the center, and what exactly is going on deep in the center? Well, let's take a look even closer. At about 3.6 3 centimeter radio light, the inner 20 by 20 light years shows gaseous material that is actually spiraling around at extraordinary speeds, hundreds of kilometers per second or thousands of kilometers per second, yet there's still an incredibly bright point source right at the center. And there's these arms of gas that are swirling around, but look at that bright source. And we're going to go zoom in even further at 3.6 centimeters, and zooming in further we see the arms of gas that are moving extraordinarily fast, but yet there's still that incredibly bright point source right at the center. What is going on there? Well. This didn't stop. This was a result of a, a massive study by Andrea Getz, who I put in the picture in the lower left-hand frame. She heads up a group called the Galactic Center Group at UCLA, and they went and used the Keck Observatory in adaptive optics mode in order to actually visualize the center of the Milky Way in the near infrared. And we can see the difference in the Keck Observatory with adaptive optics on and adaptive optics off. And we can definitely see that you get much higher resolution with adaptive optics on. And the plus is the center of the dynamic structure of all of these stars now. All of these objects are stars that you see that are orbiting uh, something down in there. We see a, a, an incredible number of stars inside the center of the Milky Way. So in the inner two light years by two light years, this is one of one of the Getz group's images, uh, these in infrared, we see that there's thousands of stars inside of a volume of space where nearby the sun there's only like two or three stars. Uh, because even if it, you'd have to go diagonally across this image to get from the Sun to Alpha Centauri. That's out by us, but, in, but down in the center of the Milky Way, there are literally thousands of stars packed into the inner two light years around the dynamic center of all of this. But yet there is no distinct bright object directly in the center. There's some bright gas and bright dust that's being warmed. There's some bright star-like structures, but there's some nothing directly bright deep in the center in infrared. So now what we can do is, this is what Getz's group has been doing for the last two, 20 years, last two decades, she's been leading a team at UCLA, and it's the, called the Getz group, and it's the Galactic Center Study Group, and they've been actually mapping uh, using the Keck Observatory and other observatories in order to discover the actual motions of the stars down in the center. And what we see is that these things are swirling about over the course of over the course of uh, the about 15 or 20 years, 
And in order for them to move in this exact way, according to Newton's law of gravity, the thing that's down there must be four million times the mass of the sun in order for them to move that fast over the, over the, over the size scales that we're looking, which correspond to huge orbital parameters. And so there's something big there. And this is a map of the thing that we actually saw in the previous, in the previous uh, little video that they made. So here's her work with her team at UCLA. And we see one of the more important ones is that there that the star SO2, which kind of has an which is that reddish pinkish ellipse in the dead center that's very very small, that one has an orbital period of about 20 years, and so every 20 years it gets close to whatever is at the center, and they can actually map these things and see where and they can actually track the motions. So here's another interesting group bit of bit of work that they've done and. What's incredibly important is what is going to happen in zooming in in just a little bit. So now as it's zoomed in, we can see a specific star that's actually moving around. I'm sorry, this might be the Max Planck Institute's work uh, instead. We'll be actually seeing some of their work as well. So there's another star. There's that one that kind of whips around really tight, and that has a 20-year orbit. So they're going to zoom in on the box. And the box is going to zoom in, and we see it's tracing out the orbit of one star going around that plus. And that plus is the dynamic center of the Milky Way. And in order for that star to move that way, something's got to be four million times the mass of the sun, according to Kepler's laws. Now, what's amazing is that starting July of 2018 is that Andrea Getz's group, after 20 years of studying this, this has been her career, is that they're finally waiting for this star, S0 number 2, to pass within a thousand times the, the size of whatever this thing is, and I've just given it away, there's a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And what they do is they're actually checking to see how its orbit changes. And there are predictions as to what the orbital appearance will be if, it's, if gravity is governed by Newton's laws or if it's governed by by, uh, by Einstein's theory of rel general relativity. And they're completely different, and they can actually have such an accurate degree of measurement that they can actually tell between the two theories. They can tell because the orbit will have a different shape, the speeds will be different, they'll accelerate and decelerate differently there, and so you can actually distinguish between the two. And in September of 2018, they're going to issue forth an interesting thing where it discusses exactly how the uh, how this thing has changed. So they made their May observations, they made their April observation, and now as it's leaving the gravity well, with the being so close to that supermassive black hole, that they're going to be able to distinguish. They're going to be able to tell something important about the nature of space-time close to a supermassive black hole. So, watch for the future. And this comes from their website. Just go to the UCLA Galactic Center group with Andrea Getz, G H E Z. All right. So um, this uh, this is uh, this is also a study by the Max Planck Institute, led by Dr. Genzel, and they assume that something is about 3.7 or 4 million solar masses. Let's just call it four because what the heck. And we can see that this is the orbit of that particular star. The dimension of this orbit is a few light days. So this thing is going around in 20 years where, remember that the Voyager spacecraft, if we look at how far Voyager is currently from the sun, it's about 17 or 18 light hours, almost a light day away. So the, the about one eighth of the length of the long axis of this ellipse that you see here is about how far the Voyager has gone from the Earth. But the Voyager has taken uh, since 1975 to get there, taken uh, 40 years to get there. This is, does this makes one of those orbits and goes way out past it, that and comes back eight times the current distance between the Earth and Voyager, which is at 100 astronomical units. So it would be 1,000 astronomical units away. So it so this is a very long orbit, but it does that orbit instead of instead of taking hundreds or thousands of years to do. It takes twenty. So something's yanking on it really hard, and that something is a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. That's about four million solar masses, and this is what they found in 1992 to 2013. Their observations uh, were modeled by uh, could be modeled by general relativity. 
which is the which is the which which is the curve on the right hand side. So the orbit is what's been done. The UCL group UCLA group by Andrea Getz is in the the red star pluses, and the Max Planck group is in the blue. But what we see is that both of them can fit the general relativistic group, but now they're actually going to measure the acceleration deceleration over the course of the next few weeks and months uh, as it passes by the supermassive black hole named Sagittarius A star or SGR A star. All right, so here's the uh, here's what those orbits kind of look like, and we can definitely see it's kind of a nifty little view. That uh, and S, the nice thing about the the star S SO2 is that the the orbit itself is almost face on. See, the, there's other stars, say SO3 or that other one that kind of swoops in on that really tight orbit in the green line. That its its orbit is not so face on, and we can't see a full orbit. However, SO2 is almost a face on ellipse, and its orientation is perfect for actually making these kinds of measurements and knowing the mass because we can see the exact size of the ellipse. The orientation can be easily derived because of because the offset of the center from the from the focus from the apparent appearance of it. So. Andrea Getz's group can make a very accurate measurement of the exact size of it, and so as well as the Max Planck group, and this is what they've been doing for the last 20 plus years. All right, so what we've learned over the course of time, and it's really a fascinating thing, is that stars are moving in very quickly near the black near something that is not making any light. It's there's an enormous amount of radio emission, but still, it's not visible. There's no visible object. There's no bright star. And there's nothing, if there was a four million solar mass star there, or four million star, solar mass cluster of stars, it'd be pretty bright. It'd be insanely bright. And it's not there. We see a bunch of stars in downtown central, central galactic center, but we do not see one bright object that overwhelms everything. So there's something there that weighs 4 million solar masses that emits almost no light but affects its surroundings amazingly. And that thing is a supermassive black hole. And we talked about black holes previously, but this is the source of all of that very interesting phenomena, the stars moving very quickly, the magnetic fields, the X-ray emission, the diffuse X-ray emission, um, all the cloudy structure and the violent structure is due to this thing that's actually physically really small, but has an enormous influence on its surroundings in the area. So the galactic center has a stellar density. There's more stars in there, millions of times more stars nearer in the, in the, in the volume than there are near the Earth. There's an enormous ring of molecular gas, about 400 parsecs across, that emits in, uh, in, in radio light as well as infrared. There are incredibly strong magnetic fields that permeate the entire area. There's a huge rotating ring of gas and dust that can be seen that's a few parsecs across right around the center, and there's an incredibly strong X-ray source in the center. That means that there's a supermassive black hole in the center of our Milky Way, and that's about 3.7 solar masses. But uh, what we saw at the, or at the outset was something in the center of Andromeda. And the Andromeda galaxy appears to have a supermassive black hole that's 100 million solar masses. This is really an amazing thing. So these are that that what's what's astonishing is is that there are many ways to look for supermassive black holes, or just black holes in general. But one of the best pieces of evidence for the existence of a black hole, or even that they exist at all, is in the center of the Milky Way. And we can look for Cygnus X1, we can look for lots of other things, but just the fact that we can actually see so much detail on this object that's very, very, very close by by comparison allows us to really understand the nature of black holes and general relativity in our own backyard. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll be getting, now that we've seen that, we're going to venture out into the rest of the cosmos and see what the rest other galaxies look like and that's what will be coming up next. So we'll see you soon.